Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here at the Heritage Foundation. I'm John Hilbolt, Director of Lectures and Seminars, and it's my privilege to welcome you to our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium, and of course to welcome those who join us on each occasion uh, from our Heritage.org website. Uh, hosting our discussion this afternoon and introducing our special guest is Joe Postel. Mr. Postel is Assistant Director of the B. Kenneth Simon Center for American Studies. Before joining Heritage in 2007, he taught political science courses at the University of Dallas, where he is completing his doctorate in American political thought and political philosophy. In 2005, he was a Publius Fellow at the Claremont Institute in California and is a member of the American Political Science Association. He has a master's degree in politics from the University of Dallas and earned his bachelor's degree in political science from Ashland University in Ohio. Would you please welcome my colleague, Joe Postel. Joe? Thank you, John, and thank you all for coming to attend to what I think uh, is a very important subject in these times. Uh, it seems that there is now a consensus among liberals and conservatives that the New Deal was legitimate, both constitutionally and politically. Conservatives challenged the New Deal at its inception, but they rarely do so today. As evidence of this conservative consensus on the New Deal, one might cite famous historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s 1996 presidential poll, where Franklin Delano Roosevelt was ranked as one of only three great presidents in American history. Schlesinger suggested that now, and I quote, conservatives accept FDR at the top with stoic calm, end quote. Well, I think it's safe to say that our guest today does not accept FDR at the top with stoic calm. And after reading uh, this very fascinating and informative book, New Deal or Raw Deal, it is easy to see why. Perhaps one exchange in particular, which I learned about in this book, reveals the core of FDR's philosophy for changing America. Alexander Forbes, a cousin of FDR, defended those who had used charitable donations as tax deductions to avoid very high marginal tax rates. Forbes thought that these contributions advanced social well-being much more effectively than FDR's centralized administrative programs. And he wrote to FDR, quote, Look at the sorry spectacle presented by those long rows of beneficiaries of the boondoggle and contrast it with the great universities, museums, and research laboratories which have come from the wise and generous giving of such as J.P. Morgan, and then consider which is the major constructive force in building a stable civilization. End quote. To which Roosevelt replied, That being your belief, I do not hesitate to brand you as one of the worst anarchists in the United States. Roosevelt considered the private sphere to be inherently less capable of producing prosperity than government programs, and he had no tolerance for those who held a different view, branding them anarchists. Have we arrived at a point today where the overwhelming majority of Americans agree with Roosevelt? We may get our answer soon enough, because we just might be getting a fresh look at the New Deal philosophy of government in the coming months. Maybe it's now time, more than ever, for a fresh look at FDR and the New Deal. And there's no better scholar to help us reconsider the New Deal than Dr. Burton Folsom. He holds the Charles F. Klein Chair in History and Management at Hillsdale College. He has been a senior fellow in economic education and economic history for the Mackinac Center for Public Policy and serves as senior historian at the Foundation for Economic Education. He is the author of several books, including the very important book, The Myth of the Robber Barons, now in its fifth edition. Please welcome Dr. Folsom. Thank you, Joe, and thank you to the Heritage Foundation. And I'm glad to have my wife, Anita, also at Hillsdale College here with me. And thank you, audience. And it's hard to have a stoic calm about Franklin Roosevelt because he's such a fascinating figure. It was fun to write a book in which Franklin Roosevelt is the major figure in the book. He is exciting to write on. He is a central figure in American history. And it is very questionable whether he warrants a place as a great president in American history. I see his life in many ways as a political tragedy.
here you had somebody who was living off the fame of his famous cousin, Theodore Roosevelt. It helped get him elected to the state legislature in New York and an appointment as Assistant Secretary of Navy, just as Theodore Roosevelt had held decades earlier. Minor positions, he's 40 years old, has accomplished very little on his own. And then he gets polio. A career-ending disease for just about anybody who ever had it. But Roosevelt, one trait he had was persistence. And that persistence, plus the help of some friends he had, Lewis Howe and Missy LeHand in particular, those assistants who worked and chugged on his behalf and wrote letters. And Roosevelt was there in his wheelchair, was able to shake hands, was able to, with assistance, uh, walk with uh, guidance and help holding him up. Roosevelt was able to turn this lackluster career into an upset victory for governor of New York, the largest state in the Union, which puts him in contention for the presidential hunt in 1932, and then, lo and behold, a Great Depression, and the Republican era is going to be shattered and ended. Roosevelt will assume the presidency. And here you have somebody charismatic, somebody who had a way with words, eloquent on the radio, starts out saying the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, trying to instill confidence in the American people. All of this, a dramatic story, overcoming adversity, into the presidency at a grand time in our history. And yet I submit that his career is that of a political tragedy. He had a failed presidency in the sense that he never got us out of the Great Depression. In his first two terms, he had a situation which was so bad that we had unemployment six years after he was president of over 20%. When you consider that before the Great Depression, the highest rate of unemployment that we had ever had in our history was 18%. To be in office for six years, to launch the New Deal, and then at the end of six years to have 20% unemployment. Sometimes it would range down to 17 or 18, but in that range, 17 to 21, is a failure that simply must be explained. What in the world went wrong? Let me just uh, talk about this a little bit by quoting from Roosevelt's Secretary of Treasury, Henry Morgenthau. Morgenthau was put in the Treasury Department because he was such a good friend of Roosevelt's. Roosevelt wanted an ally in the Treasury Department, someone who would help him implement programs, spend money. The two, Roosevelt and Morgenthau, they lived near each other in upstate New York, they had campaigned in politics together. Uh, Morgenthau knew Roosevelt before his polio episode. Their wives shopped together. Uh, the two men would chat and pass notes during cabinet meetings sometimes. Morgenthau had a sign on his, in his office, Roosevelt, a picture of both of them. And Roosevelt signed it to Henry from one of two of a kind, Franklin Roosevelt. Morgenthau deeply liked Roosevelt and gave his life as a career, in career to help Roosevelt. And yet dealing with this unemployment was so frustrating to Morgenthau that finally in 1939, Morgenthau said this. He said it privately. He did not make this a public statement, but he said it nonetheless privately to Democratic leaders. We have tried spending money. We are spending more than we have ever spent before, and it does not work. We have never made good on our promises. I say after eight years of this administration, we have just as much unemployment as when we started, and an enormous debt to boot. He knew whereof he was speaking. He saw the statistics on unemployment. He saw the statistics on the national debt from 1776 and the Revolutionary War up to the time Roosevelt came into office. 
we accumulated about $20 billion of debt. Roosevelt, in the seven years in which we still had 20% or thereabouts unemployment, had spent another $20 billion. In other words, in Roosevelt's two terms, or less than his two terms, actually, we spent more than every administration in the United States had ever spent on federal spending, whether it's Civil War, World War I, Mexican War, Revolutionary War, whatever. The federal debt had doubled. The New Deal had created circumstances where unemployment was still at 20% or almost 20%. Morgenthau was expressing his frustration, and the question we must ask is what went wrong? What went wrong? I think as we analyze the New Deal programs, and I study many of them in depth in my book, we can look and, at them and say a centrally directed economy simply does not work well at all. A centrally directed economy ultimately results in programs that fail, programs that have terrible unintended consequences, programs that do not accomplish what market forces accomplish. In the case of Roosevelt, he was so sure it would go well because he had brain trusters working with him. He had experts. Let me give you a couple examples, programs designed by experts, heavily influenced by experts. You start out with a farming crisis. Roosevelt's program, the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. The problem, well, the farmers are getting low prices because there's a lot of overproduction. Now, part of the reason we have overproduction is because under President Hoover, we passed the highest tariff in U.S. history. Other nations, when we refuse to buy their imports, they refuse to buy our imports. Thus, the agricultural market, which in, for example, in wheat is about 25% of the total crop, you lose your export market, you have a surplus, and you have declining prices. Well, now, it might occur to someone that getting rid of the tariff would help because then other countries would be more likely to buy your goods because you're buying more of their goods. And to Roosevelt's credit, he did talk in the campaign and eventually move toward freer trade. To his credit, that he did do, but it was a slow process. Right off, it was the AAA and the idea here, here's the solution. And the brain trusters helped him with this. We will pay farmers not to produce. And if we pay farmers not to produce on part of their land, then some of the land will be taken out of circulation. We won't have crops that would have been produced on that land that go to market. And then the remaining crop will have a higher price because there won't be as much of it. And therefore, that will help solve the farming crisis. Well, first we get into the unintended consequences. We're going to pay farmers not to produce. It sounds funny, doesn't it? We have hungry people. We have over 20% unemployment, so we'll pay people not to produce. But in any case, we've started out, and we find that some farmers say, yeah, we'll take 25% of our land out of circulation. But we have to send people around to check on them, because although they say that they'll take it out of circulation, if we don't have somebody go over to make sure they actually did, then we will be paying them to plant more crops on their land. So we have to send checkers around. Well, lo and behold, the checkers are there measuring land on uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of farms throughout the country. And then we found out that a lot of diminishing of the land is not occurring because some of the checkers are being bribed. So then we have to send checkers on the checkers. So we have paying people not to produce, but to make sure they really don't produce, we send people to check and make sure they don't produce. In my first academic job, I had as chairman of the tenure committee, a man who went to a conference 
I had a chance to go to a conference with him, and I thought, hey, this is great. I'll have a chance to ingratiate myself with an important person within the history department. And we were asking each other what we did, and I explained some of my background, and he was talking about his background, and he said that he had once worked for the AAA as a checker. And I was just so naive, I blurted out, did you get any bribes? <laughs> he took the comment completely in stride and said, no, the best offer I had was a pair of tires, or set of tires it was. And then he complained because other people got better bribes than he did. Nonetheless, this is part of what we sometimes call the unintended consequences. We pay farmers not to produce. Now I have to make sure they're not producing. Finally, we get airplanes going over to do visual photography of the land. And lo and behold, we have a Department of Agriculture that has an absolutely astronomical budget. H.V. Kaltenborn, who was a political commentator at the time, walked in on the Department of Agriculture and gave a comment on what he saw there. He said, the amount of regulatory machinery essential to administer the AAA was a fearsome thing to behold for anyone who believed the American farmer as a master of his own domain. Thousands of inspectors had to be sent into the fields. Thousands of accountants had to keep track of what each inspector reported about, what each farmer was growing, and what benefits every grower or non-grower was entitled to receive. As soon as the AAA helped one group of farmers, other groups were affected and called for similar benefits and protective regulations. If one particular crop was controlled, the farmer would plant excessively in other crops. If acreage was controlled, he would use only the best acres. That produced a new surplus, which also had to be controlled. Farmers were paid millions of dollars not to produce crops while President Roosevelt was telling us about one-third of our people who were ill-fed. For every problem that was solved, two or three new problems were created. One of the biggest tragedies was we then came in and had some bad climate and had a drought in the Midwest, and so we had the situation of paying farmers not to produce then we had underproduction of those crops, and we had to import what we were paying farmers not to produce. For example, in 1935, we imported 35 million bushels of corn while paying corn farmers not to produce. We imported 13 million bushels of wheat. We also imported butter, ham, beef, and even cotton. All the while, we were paying people who produce those crops not to produce. Mercifully, the Supreme Court declared the AAA unconstitutional. Now, another version of it was going to be set up later, but nonetheless, it indicates a program set up, experts, we're going to make it work, it doesn't work, it doesn't resolve unemployment, it doesn't help with productivity, and we see other programs one after another like it because what we discover as we go through the New Deal programs, centrally directed economies do not work well. The United States was no exceptions during the 1930s. How many have heard of the National Recovery Act? That's the old NRA, not the new NRA with the guns, the old one. It was a big program in the 1930s, many of you know. The idea here, again, experts were helping with this. A professor at Columbia University, Rexford Tugwell, among others. The NRA is going to have industrialists get together in 500 industries. And the problem here, again, is low prices. What do you do about low prices? You have the industrialists in the industries get together and decide what prices should be charged. See, that way they'll make more money. Then they determine what those prices will be charged. Those prices then become legally binding. It's an episode of price fixing here. And those who fail to charge those prices or try to give discounts to customers will be subject to be thrown in jail. 
Let me give you one example. In the car industry, in the auto industry, General Motors, Chrysler, and others gladly signed the NRA code and, uh, and increased the products of the car, the prices of the cars they were selling, whether it's Chevrolet, Cadillac. Henry Ford refused to sign it. I'm not going to sign it, he said. He said, his comment was, I don't think America's ready to be like Russia just yet. He refused to sign. They couldn't very well throw Henry Ford in jail. But what they did do was refuse to buy any cars that were produced by Ford Motor Company for any New Deal project, even if he had the lowest bid. For example, Ford bid on a truck contract with the AAA, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and his bid was $169,000 lower than that of any other bidder. And, of course, that's uh, millions of dollars uh, in, in today's purchasing power. And uh, the CCC refused to accept Ro uh, Ford's bid because he had not signed the NRA code, which said that he would keep prices way up there. Uh, Ford's argument was, in order to live up to it, we'd have to live down to it. He refused to sign. He lost the $169,000. And President Roosevelt said, we've got to eliminate the purchase of Ford's cars for the government because Ford has not gone along with the general NRA agreement. Now, other people who were less conspicuous did get jail terms. I am speak here in particular of 49-year-old Jacob Maged, who was a tailor in New York City. He did not live on the main Fifth Avenue drag of Manhattan. He was off the beaten path, and his argument was, I can't afford to have my tailor shop at the heart of town, but I can't afford to have it off a little bit. And what I do is the money I save because I can't afford the more expensive location, I give my customers a discount, and then with that discount, they will be more likely to come to visit me, and I can make money that way. Well, the NRA Taylor's Code said you had to charge 40 cents to press a pair of pants. That would be about 4 to $5 today. 40 cents to press a pair of pants. Jacob Maged said, if I follow that, I will be charging 40. Those tailors with the good location will be charging 40, and why will they come out of the way to see me? I'll go out of business. We can look in the William Bora papers in the Library of Congress here in Washington and see example after example of people who said, if I follow the code, I will be put out of business because my location is not as good as that of other producers in the product that I make and sell. Maged is one of them. Finally, Maged said, I'm charging 35 cents anyway. And a load of customers came to see him. The NRA authorities came to visit him. And the end result was that Jacob Maged was thrown in jail for giving his customers a nickel discount on pressing a pair of pants. Now, the NRA authorities agreed with this decision uh, the uh, Abraham Trauby, who was the NRA director there in the New York area, said, we think that this is the only way to enforce the NRA. If we did the same thing throughout New York City, we would soon get the whole industry in line. So Maged is in jail, and many of the editorialists did not think that the argument against Maged was that strong. For example, the Washington Post said, it didn't matter if Maged had to charge less than the bright, shiny tailor's uh, shop up the street if he wanted to continue to exist. The law said he couldn't. For a parallel, now this is the New York Herald Tribune, for a parallel, the New York Ter Herald Tribune said, it is necessary to go to the fascist or communist states of Europe. We had others who were thrown in jail, the Moscovitzes in Cleveland, Fred Perkins in York, Pennsylvania, and the NRA code when you said Businesses set your prices. Anybody who gives a discount to customers can be thrown in jail, resulted in a tragedy. Plus, once the prices were raised, customers couldn't afford to buy a lot of the products, and the NRA flat out did not work. When the Supreme Court got a hold of the NRA, it did something that it did not often do back in those days. It had a unanimous decision, nine to zero, 
that the NRA was unconstitutional. It will be struck down. It was part of the program that Roosevelt had, his New Deal, designed by experts to help get us out of the Great Depression. Now, we had other programs in the New Deal that were not designed so much by experts, but were more politically designed. That is, politicians were maneuvering, and hey, here's a program that would be good for us, and the implication is, it's good for the economy if it's good for us. For example, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, actually which was started under Hoover but perpetuated under Roosevelt, made loans to businesses that were in trouble. It's a little bit like the bailout operations of today, only they weren't really bailouts, they were loans. What we find is, it sounds good in theory, in a way, although you're taking taxpayer dollars, you are giving loans to these companies, and if they can make a go of it, they won't lay people off, and that will be good. What we find is that so many of the loans were politically motivated. I mean, when the Republicans were in power, they'd go to people like Charles Dawes, former Republican vice president, in his bank in Chicago, which went bust anyway. But $90 million was spent on it. When Roosevelt got in, sometimes it worked the other way. Let me give you an example. Pennsylvania was a key battleground state in the 1930s. Pennsylvania had been Republican for generations, and even Hoover carried it when he ran against Roosevelt in 1932. Roosevelt believed that if he, if he could detach Pennsylvania from the Republicans and put it into his New Deal coalition, that he would be positioned to create a lasting Democratic majority. So Pennsylvania was a pivotal state for him. Philadelphia is the largest city, of course, in Pennsylvania, and you had a Republican newspaper and a Democratic newspaper. The Republican newspaper was the Philadelphia Inquirer, which was operated by Mo Annenberg. The Philadelphia Record was the Democratic newspaper, and it was run by J. David Stern. Annenberg at the Inquirer was so much better than Stern that the Philadelphia Record under Stern was about ready to go bankrupt, and the Inquirer was flourishing. Roosevelt was extremely upset over this, and the upshot was a $1 million loan to David Stern to keep the Philadelphia Record running. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, well, geez, there's a million dollars of taxpayer money going for purely partisan purposes, and, and you're right. But to Roosevelt's credit, he had a way to get the million dollars. He had encouraged Henry Morgenthau to launch an IRS attack on Mo Annenberg, which produced $7 million in back taxes and threw Mo Annenberg in jail so that the Philadelphia record could prevail over the Philadelphia Inquirer and Roosevelt carries Pennsylvania in 1936 and 1940. The danger and one of the reasons that centrally directed power is dangerous and ineffective is that once you have that central direction and once we give more power, contrary to what the founders wanted us to do, once we give more power to central authorities or to an executive, the misuse of that power almost inevitably follows. Franklin Roosevelt increased the power and authority of the IRS. Hamilton Fish, for example, was investigated. He's a congressman from Roosevelt's home district at Hyde Park. And he was a Republican and he kept winning and denouncing Roosevelt. What an embarrassment. Roosevelt said, I can vote against him every time, but a majority of the people around me keep putting him in. IRS investigation for Hamilton Fish. IRS investigation for Mo Annenberg. IRS investigation for former Secretary of Treasury Andrew Mellon, even though the people at the IRS said there's not a chance, one in a million, that he mishandled his taxes. He's, a, he's an accounting genius and honest. And Roosevelt insisted he be investigated anyway in Morgenthau. And there was nothing, no irregularities that were turned up. There were some minor accounting disagreements, but no... IRS fraud, and money was wasted investigating Mellon, but in, in his case, he did not go to jail. In Annenberg's case, he was not as 
as smooth with his finances as Mellon was, and Annenberg did go to jail and paid $7 million in back taxes. This is the danger with a centrally directed economy. We have, under the New Deal, actually starting in 1932 under Hoover and continuing under Roosevelt, the first federal welfare program in American history. You might be interested in the idea was, well, we have $300 million, which was a lot back then, and we know that there's a lot of unemployment out there and we are, there are a lot of people hungry, so the states may request money from this pot. Now, be judicious about it, because we don't have that much, but we will try to get states money to help them with their relief cases. Uh, we called welfare mainly relief back in the 1930s. One state had a governor who was so persistent that he got more money than over half the states in the Union put together. He got more money than New York, California, and Texas put together. That was the governor of Illinois. <laughs> Illinois received almost 20% of all the money received. Other states like Massachusetts with Governor Joseph Ely. Massachusetts back then was a very frugal state that wanted to live within its means. And Governor Ely said, listen, it is good for people to help people, not governments to come in and give checks. Therefore, in Massachusetts, what we're going to do is we're going to try to take care of our unemployed within the state. For example, Boston and Holy Cross had an exhibition football game to raise money. You had entrepreneurs in Massachusetts who were raising money and donating to charity. The teachers of Boston donated parts, a small part of their salary for the unemployed. Governor Ely himself took a salary cut to help. The end result was Massachusetts said, we can do it, and they asked for no money. They received no money, and they discovered at the end of the day, we have just paid not only for our own people in Massachusetts, but through various taxes, we just paid for Illinois. A dramatic change in the way Americans conceived of government, of individual liberty, the nature of private charity, all of that was undertaken at this time because what happened was Ely was ousted in 1934, into his place came Governor Curley, who said, well, now uh, Massachusetts needs $600 million. He was tr asking for double more than everybody got. Ultimately, Massachusetts was going to end up under Roosevelt getting $114 million, so they didn't get all of that. But in those, that early phase of the welfare program, he was able to get $114 million. Massachusetts had changed directions, and a lot of attitude, instead of being, let's use our own people to help take care of our own people, people who are well off to try to help one-on-one -on -one people who are hurting, the idea was, there's money out there in Washington. The more poor we can say we are, the more claim we will have on that money. Therefore, we need to say, oh, are we in need? We are so desperately in need. And we need to go to Roosevelt. We need to cooperate with him politically. We need to support the New Deal uh, to the extent that we can. And then we need to come home with as much money as we can get. This became the new mindset in the 1930s that was created with the New Deal. The final example I want to give is the WPA. The works projects, the public works. Can we get out of a, de of a Great Depression with public works? Well, uh, one thing we discovered that we could do was the Democratic Party could gain votes through public works. For example, the state of Maine back in the 1930s voted in September for the presidency. And Roosevelt tried an experiment in the state of Maine. Can we get a lot of public works into Maine, and this was his first off-year election of 1934, and change the way Maine votes? Maine had been a, historically a Republican state. He experimented. He had a Democratic governor, Louis Brand, and Louis Brand ran for re-election saying, quote, uh, he had an ad that said this, 
Quote, the knowledge and force of Governor Brand secured from the federal government $108 million for Maine. See? We went out there to Washington and came back with the goodies. Uh, Roosevelt had an experiment here in the town of Eastport, Maine. Governor Brand had lost Eastport. He'd only carried it uh, 39% of the vote in Eastport, so we decided to see what would happen if a lot of federal funds came in. Uh, federal money constructed a seawall around Eastport, rebuilt a bridge, ditched the streets, completed some tennis courts, and built a basketball court at the local high school. Uh, Professor Gary Dean Best uh, is very good at talking about this main election as well. Uh, the government took over the canning factories and distributed 40,000 cases of canned fish and then spent about $350,000 on local businesses. For local relief work, the government paid workers above the standard minimum wage. What's more, with great fanfare, Harold Ickes, head of the Public Works Administration, toured Maine three weeks before the election and gave a speech in Eastport. Ickes' job was to tantalize the voters in the whole reason, region by suggesting the PWA might fund a project to generate electric power in Eastport from water power in the Bay of Fundy and the Passamaquoddy Bay. The end result in the election, in the experiment, Franklin Roosevelt, Governor Brand, I should say, received 65% of the vote in 1934, whereas he only got 39% of the vote in 1932. The test case showed that if you spent enough federal money, those receiving it could take credit for it. Then you vote for those people because maybe they can get more for you. The problem is, and this is my final point, is that this all has to be paid for out of tax money. A, dollar, a, a, a job that's created with tax money is taken at the expense of a job that is lost because somebody no longer has the money to spend on the tax, uh, on creating a job or buying a product that might create a job. Let me give you an example of how it worked. The income tax rate went under Roosevelt up to a top rate of 79% on top incomes. Roosevelt, once we got to 1940, suggested it be raised to 99.5% on all income over $100,000. Ultimately, Franklin Roosevelt passed an executive order for an income tax of 100% on all income over $25,000 in April 27th, 1942. At the lower end of income, most people did not have to pay the income tax, and so what they did was they paid excise taxes. And we had unprecedented increases in excise taxes and expansion of products that are covered by excise taxes. For, and previously in American history, we'd, we'd had a hist uh, whiskey tax, and we've had taxes on tobacco, vice taxes. Those, of course, were well in place. But Roosevelt, it, or starting in 1932, and then, especially under Roosevelt, when he was elected in 32, we get taxes on cars, telephones, telegrams, movie tickets. Hey, we heard people are escaping the Great Depression by going to movies. Movie ticket tax. And the first federal gas tax, starting at one cent a gallon. Oh, but what an entering wedge it is, because, of course, later it's going to be raised to over 18 cents a gallon. All of these excise taxes are going to hit middle and lower income earners especially hard. And so when you hear about New Deal programs like paying farmers not to produce or the NRA or road building, the WPA built some roads. Some of them were good. Some were good roads. Some buildings, school buildings and hospitals they erected were good. Others were boondoggles, and the word boondoggle became a popular word in the 1930s. But some of the building projects were good. But what you have to think of, even when you think of a good building project, you need to think money is being taken from lower middle class, middle class Americans who drive to work and are paying a gas tax. If they smoke or drink, they're paying a tax. If they go to a movie, they're paying a tax. If they make calls on the telephone, they're paying tax. If they send telegrams, they're paying tax. Bits and little chunks are being taken out of average Americans in order to put together to build a road in the state of Maine 
so that Governor Brand can take credit for it and win re-election. That is the politics of the New Deal. And one of the reasons Roosevelt was so successful and popular with many Americans is they say, hey, I got my road built. You did. But what we don't say in the New Deal is at the expense of all of those people at their excise taxes, with those high excise taxes, and with the high income taxes, which had the effect of discouraging entrepreneurs from starting new industries, thus contributing to the perpetuation of the Great Depression, which helps explain why we have, six years after President Roosevelt in effect, unemployment rates around the 20, 17 to 21 percent level. The New Deal programs, unfortunately, they did not work Centrally directed programs do not work well. We can learn that by studying the 1930s, by studying the New Deal, and by studying the tragedy of the presidency, a failed presidency, of Franklin Roosevelt. Thank you. Important lessons for today, I would suggest. We have some time for questions and answers, so uh, please wait for the microphone to reach you and identify uh, who you are and uh, what organization you're with. Thanks. Yes. Yes, sir, go ahead. My name is Ed Powers. Uh, I appreciate your talk very much. I grew up in a uh, New Deal, Roosevelt idealizing family. So it took me uh, generations to uh, see it as a different, in a different light. But nevertheless, uh, no one can argue that the Depression ended with the war and not the 30s and the policies that FDR had. No, I don't think there's any fuzz on that. However, I, I, I think some of your arguments to me were a little simplistic about the 30s. I, I think that... Uh, uh, FDR beat Hoover because the country was in a shambles, so to speak. No confidence in administration and high unemployment, etc. Yet in the next four years, uh, I think unemployment did come down substantially, more than just a few, pen, a few percent. And Roosevelt's re-election in 1936 was the largest uh, majority losing only Maine and Vermont in, in American history. So the people believed something was positive was happening. Now, the next four years, I think, they went downhill again. Roosevelt still won overwhelmingly. But if you had large unemployment, and yet the administration is still winning and winning very large, it, it seems like there's something else involved. And my belief is that it, it wasn't economic, but there was a psychological uh, belief in the U.S. that they had confidence in this administration, regardless of the policies. To me, it's a little akin to Reagan coming into power, uh, morning in America, we can look up again. Somehow, I think there was confidence in FDR, even though the policies were, uh, were not great policies. And I said, a bad precedent for the future, I agree. So I'd like to get your feedback on that, because uh, I, I don't think it's simply dollars and cents or nuts and bolts. There's more to it than that, why he was so successful during that era. Right. You really have two parts to your question. Uh, the first part is the business of World War II. And Robert Higgs, uh, among other economists and historians, has made the point that really in World War II, what you've done is you've transferred maybe 12 million or so people from being unemployed to a similar, in some cases, identical people, in some cases a little different, but 12 million people overseas. And that really doesn't resolve a Great Depression. It merely transfers people into another part where they're being paid for by the federal government. And what we see as an upshot of that is a tremendous growth in the national debt. Uh, Higgs argues that when Roosevelt died that there was a, a view that, hey, now maybe the tax rates will be reduced and maybe we can get in there and invest. 
And the Republicans took control of Congress in 1946. We get Taft-Hartley and some other uh, where right-to-work laws come in. Some changes that create some optimism. And it's at least his argument, therefore, that we need to focus on the aftermath of Roosevelt when we look at recovery from the Great Depression rather than the war itself. Now, you're making uh, your other point, I think, is a good one in that I've ha I had to think about this for a long time because you have to look at Roosevelt's astounding victory in 1936. We had a little bit of drop, but we still had uh, roughly 14 percent unemployment. You know, that's still double digit. We never had a period in our history before where we had as many as five years of depression or slash recession. You know, the Panic of 1873, the Panic of 1837, all of these were over with in roughly between three and five years. And so now we're extending um, into a much longer period. And Yet Roosevelt seems, and unemployment is still very high, Roosevelt wins. One of the reasons I'd like to suggest is what I posed here with the example of Maine, that if you make mayors of cities and you make states beholden to your federal aid, then they'll go back and say, hey, we brought so much money in there. If you'll reelect us, we Democrats, we'll get more for you. But if you let those Republicans in, the old aid may start coming in, stop coming in. Alf Landon, the Republican candidate, was caught in this a little bit because he started out saying, hey, the AAA is terrible. This is stupid. I'm governor of Kansas. I know. Then all of a sudden farmers came up, oh, you're going to take away our subsidy, are you? Uh, he says, uh, no, no, we'll do it a little bit better, though, than Roosevelt. We're, we're going to make it more efficient. And so then the voters have a chance, if you're a farmer voting, do I vote for the guy who gave me my subsidy and is paying me not to produce, or a guy who says he'll do it better. Well, I think that Roosevelt is in position to get those votes, even though the program isn't working. The WPA the same way. You put roads in areas that are politically important, and then you tell people there may be more to come if you'll elect the Democrats. And though, even though it's not working in a macroeconomic sense, we sense, we still have high unemployment. You have people thinking in a micro sense, I may get something. I may get the next subsidy if Roosevelt's reelected. And so you get Roosevelt benefiting from that. How else can we explain the odd, this oddity? In the Panic of 1873, President Grant lost in the next election, and we had 14 percent unemployment. He lost 77 seats in the House. Grover Cleveland, when we get 18% unemployment in 1894, he loses 113 seats. Franklin Roosevelt in 1934, with 22% unemployment, gains nine seats. Something that we had never seen before happen. And I'm suggesting with that example I gave from the state of Maine and other examples that I give in my book, that it's a change in mindset. It's a change saying, okay, we've got a more centrally directed economy. The issue now is can I get something from it? We put excise taxes and we get the high income taxes. We take that money and we dole it out in a way, as James Farley said, who was postmaster general and helped to dole it out, in a way it will do the most good for us. And that we have a lot of people saying, I'm, I have a bad situation, but maybe I can get a subsidy. And I'll vote for Roosevelt. It's a dramatic change in the way people view their government, in the way people view their president, and I think a very dangerous change. And one, because we didn't get it out of our system, I hope it's not one that we have to go through again 75 years later because we didn't learn from the problems that were created when we tried it in the 1930s with the New Deal. Yes, sir. I'm Raymond Schmidt, retired. And 25, 30 years ago, we hired a piano teacher for my son, which meant we had to hire a piano tuner. The piano tuner came all the way down to Maryland from Pennsylvania special drive to get cash for his piano tuning. That is, there's a large amount of money uh, that changed hands that was not taxable. Similarly, uh, butter and eggs were exchanged for labor on the farm and so on. I just wonder how much of that went on during the 30s. Very good. Uh, this is something that's a little bit hard to identify and to quantify, but impressionistic impressionistically, or as we might say anecdotally, there is a lot of evidence of goods being changed because you escape taxes 
when you do that. And that becomes, therefore, somewhat of a more efficient way of, of doing business. And that's just another, another byproduct of a system that gives you high excise taxes, uh, that increases taxes, is that you get more of a barter economy. Good point. Uh, Matt Spalding here at Heritage. Uh, I've got a, I got a question for you. The, the way the New Deal is oftentimes taught, it's taught as if it's a monolithic thing that he was, you know, ran on 1932. Here's my plan, but it seems to be much more of an ad hoc. It is thing. That raises a question then, since in 32, I believe he he ran on a very different way of looking at things. What gave rise to these plans? And if they really were ad hoc in terms of the actual. Pieces, it would suggest there, might have, there was some sort of larger mindset about changing how government worked, how the economies worked, uh, things like that. What, how do you account for those kinds of changes that gave rise to this in the first place? And I ask that because the, looking at the parallel today, there isn't, a, there isn't a new deal that has been presented, but the situation seems to suggest that someone coming in with a certain mindset might be attracted to such kinds of policies. So I think the parallel and understanding how you might explain that would be a good thing to know. You know. Matt, what you say is exactly right, that Roosevelt did not come in with the intentions to have huge amounts of federal spending. In fact, he promised to balance the budget and cut federal spending by 25%. It was in the Democratic platform, and he said, I'm going to only appoint people who agree with this. He wanted to cut the costs of the government, and he attacked Hoover for having too many programs. He argued for lower tax, uh, lower tax rates. He also, uh, even more, argued for removing or reducing the Smoot-Hawley tariff. So those were programs. That's a program that might have worked. And I, I have a chapter on that in, the book, in my book. You know, what should Roosevelt have done? And if he had followed through on his campaign promises, I think that we might have been able to get through this in the typical four or five year period that we've had for economic crises. But then you have the question, well, why do you start this? And it is kind of ad hoc. Roosevelt often said, we don't know what we're going to be doing six weeks from now. You know, it was kind of a haphazard deal. Brain trusters would come up with, with an idea and he might implement it or he might not. You would have political constituencies who would come in with an idea, like the silver miners. They said, hey, we're depressed. Uh, we're only getting 40 cents an ounce for our silver, and that isn't very much. And so we passed the Silver Purchase Act, which guarantees 64 and a half cents an ounce for silver. Well, yeah, now all of a sudden we're digging up twice as much silver as we ever dug before to send it to Washington at a subsidized price. We spent $300,000 a day every day for 14 years on this. Well, this is the sort of haphazard program that you just put into effect because of a, a political interest group, and that is the larger point. Once Roosevelt was in, free markets benefit lots of people. Low taxes, you let turn people loose to see what they can produce, and it, it, we, we, even under Hoover, we had tax, the tax rate had been 63%. If Roosevelt would have reduced that, it would have given investors a chance to, an incentive to invest. If we had lowered the Smoot-Hawley tariff immediately, and I want to make the point, Roosevelt did gradually reduce that over time. But if we had reduced that immediately, we would have had markets for our agri more markets for our agricultural products. And if he had, if he had reduced uh, federal spending, the budget deficit would not have uh, impinged and, uh, on our economy and caused us to have to pay interest rates on the national debt. So we didn't do that, but you get advocacy groups in effect. See, look at those silver miners, for example. They dominate the economies of seven states. Roosevelt carried those seven states when he ran for re-election. You give them their 64 and a half cents an ounce instead of 40 cents an ounce, you get seven silver states. You pass a triple A and you pay people not to produce, those people who are being paid not to produce become part of your voting bloc. You get an NRA that tells industries that they can charge whatever they want or whatever they agree on for cars or suits or shoes or whatever. We find they jack their prices up and they're grateful and they support the New Deal. It's damaging for the economy, 
But at a micro level, for individual interest groups, it can sometimes be very good. And Roosevelt succumbed, as many politicians do, to the temptation of giving in to the interest groups who promise you votes for a program, rather than turning the economy loose on the what seems like a myopic hope that free market people will invent things. Well, we tried this in the 1920s when we reduced taxes substantially, and we found, my gosh, they invented things like sliced bread. You know, we had radios come in. We invented the zipper in the 1920s. The man who invented the zipper, and he finally put it into effect after the tax rates dropped, he was told when he went to the patent office, I don't know if we can patent this because I don't, can't imagine a use for it. But in the 1920s, we get it marketed, first on galoshes. And then, lo and behold, we find zippers might be used on clothes, too. We invented scotch tape in the 1920s. Air conditioning received a boost of popularity in the 1920s, thus creating opportunities in the South. None of that was planned. And a bunch of it, nobody could figure out what the product was ever going to be used for. I mentioned the zipper. And yet entrepreneurs turn, coming loose with products created incredible economic development and expansion. And under President Coolidge, we only had 3.3% average unemployment in his administration. Three years earlier, after World War I, we had high unemployment of 12%. We cut taxes. We reduced federal spending. And lo and behold, these entrepreneurs came out of the woodwork and were all of a sudden down to 3% unemployment. Because in markets... Entrepreneurs will come loose and unexpectedly produce things that you can't imagine they would produce, uh, whether, it's, whether it's video games or microwave ovens or computers or whatever that we've seen in the last couple generations, and those products will become part of American life and create unemployment. It's easier for the politician to say, well, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. Let's just have a targeted subsidy to an interest group. Roosevelt yielded to that temptation, and therefore his presidency went in a, in a different direction than Reagan's presidency went because when Reagan got in with high inflation and unemployment, he cut the income tax and all of a sudden, sudden Silicon Valley in California, other places in the United States began to get productive and we had a set of products, I mean, Walkman radios, cell phones, all of this coming out of the 1980s that we are still benefiting from today. Last question. This one's a long shot. Andrew Martin, by the way, I'm just a curious American, no affiliation. Uh, okay. Did anything good in the long term come from the you know, <laughs> Come from Roosevelt's presidency? Well, he did reduce the tariff. I think sometimes the reforms in the Sec uh, Securities and, and Exchange Commission had some benefits. And so I do think we, get, we had a few things here and there, but I would say, uh, aside from a few minor examples, most of the changes that were done under a centrally directed economy were failures. And those changes had an impact on American society because the New Deal coalition that built around Roosevelt, a lot of them said, hey, we like our subsidy. We want it continued. And it perpetuated a myth in American history for the next 75 years that, hey, if you're in trouble, let's start a WPA. Let's get something centrally directed going, and then that will help us. That myth is one we are still living with today if we look more carefully at the New Deal, I think we will come up with another model for looking at this problem, and that is that free markets do better for an economy than central direction does. Well, uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, again, the book is uh, New Deal or Raw Deal, and our author is delighted to sign copies that you purchase, which are available uh, outside the auditorium. Thanks again for coming.